and watch the images come on the TV screen. But when I saw the first few frames, I recognized instantly what it was. It was footage that I hadn't seen literally in decades, but had been taken with a home movie camera over a series of periods dating between 1938, which was before I was born, and 1942, which was after I was born. And the first series on the screen showed people filing out of a church on Easter Sunday morning, shaking hands with their pastor at the front door. I immediately recognized the pastor as the man who baptized me, and I was watching to see if I recognized other people coming out of the church, and I saw my grandfather, my grandmother, then my father and my mother, and some other relatives. And as this movie unfolded through 1939, 1940, 41, 42, into the war years and so on, I saw on the screen all of my relatives, all of my cousins, all of my aunts and uncles, my mother and father, grandfather, grandmother, and all the rest. And this was real serendipity because I've said all of my life that I remember nothing with greater fondness from my youth than the memories of our family. And we had some discussions about this that indicate that no matter how close you may come with certain people as friends during your lifetime, there simply is nothing like family. And what has meant so much to me in our family is the profound sense of loyalty that is manifested in the bonds of that family love. Not just loyalty between parents and children, but among cousins and aunts and uncles. And uh, I keep thinking that this is the structured unit that God established upon which to build nations and also upon which to build His church. And in my own lifetime, I have witnessed the radical disintegration of family in our culture. And so I think that it's fitting that at a conference where we are examining holiness, and particularly the holiness of God, that we consider how the character of God relates to this business of family. And so I'd like to turn your attention to the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but rather segments from it beginning at verse 1, where the apostle gives an admonition, where he says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. We know that one of the most important truths of the New Testament revelation of our redemption is the truth of our adoption into the family of God in Christ Jesus. And I notice here 
that the call that the apostle gives us is to the imitation of God. Which call, beloved, was given to us in creation? where every person who was created by God was created in his image and was called to mirror and to reflect, that is to imitate the Creator. So we might expect the Bible to say, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved creatures. But you see, at this point in redemptive history, we're more than creatures. Paul calls us to imitate God not simply as creatures made in His image, but as His children who have been redeemed by His Son, who was the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. For in the Son of the Father we have seen perfect imitation. And so we read here, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma." Now, do you see how this is progressing? The first call is a call to imitate God, then to say to imitate Him as children. And really, the imitation of God is a consequence of following Christ. So we are to imitate Christ in order to imitate God. Now, my task this afternoon is to talk about the role of the husband and the father in the family. And what I want to look at is how the father and the husband imitates Christ, who imitates God. And so let's, now that we have the haircut behind us, let's get our Latin for the weekend behind us. I'm going to try to make this the only Latin reference that I will make for the entire weekend, and we'll see how successful I am. Those two words, munis, triplex, find their foundation in the Protestant Reformation with the magisterial reformers seeking to give a summary of the ministry of Christ. And the munis triplex refers simply to the threefold office of Christ, to Christ's office as prophet, as priest, and as king. We see those offices displayed in the Old Testament, where the difference in the Old Testament between a prophet and a priest was this. Both prophet and priest were mediators. They stood between God and the people, and the simple difference was this, that the prophet spoke to the people for God. The prophet was an agent of revelation, a mouthpiece for God who could preface his statements to the people of Israel by saying, Thus saith the Lord. By contrast, the priest spoke to God in behalf of the people. His was a ministry of intercession and of the making of sacrifices and offerings in behalf of the people to God. And of course, the third office in the Old Testament was the office of king 
and the king in Israel did not reign autonomously, but rather the king in Israel was subjected to the king's law because the king was supposed to represent the rule of God. And he was to demonstrate the justice of God and the compassion of God and the righteousness of God as God's agent in his role as king. And of course you know throughout the Old Testament history that rarely was it the case that a king truly represented the character of God. But we notice that in the Old Testament, the prophets looked forward to Christ. They spoke of the one who would come in time, who would be the incarnation of God, the sin bearer of the people, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. And the prophet's object of prophecy was Christ. And when we fast forward to the New Testament, we see that Christ himself appears as a prophet. He is the living Word of God who shows forth the character of God to the people, and he says, I speak nothing on my own authority, but all that the Father reveals to me, I declare to you. So he is a spokesman for God the Father. In that sense, in his personal subjectivity, he, as a living subject, is a prophet. So what we see that's unusual about Jesus is that Jesus is both the object and the subject of prophecy. And when we look at his work as priest, we see the same thing is the case. He is both subject and object. Why? In the Old Testament, the priests offered sacrifices. Christ is the perfect sacrifice, and His sacrifice is offered not by somebody else, but by Himself, so that what Christ offers as the great high priest is Himself being subject and object of the priesthood. And finally, He is the total and perfect fulfillment of the Davidic king in the Old Testament, the shepherd king, the servant king, who redeems the people over whom he rules. Now, that's a brief thumbnail sketch of the threefold office of Jesus. And now we want to look at how that fits with us as men, as husbands, and as fathers. So if we skip ahead here in the text of Ephesians, we go to verse 19, which picks up a thought in the middle, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. For almost 2,000 years, every commentator on Ephesians understood this verse to be an introductory verse to what follows whereby the apostle sets forth different uh, persons in different roles who are to be submissive in different ways. And he introduces this by pointing out that there is a principle of submission in humility that is to mark the Christian home and is to mark the Christian community. I don't think there was a, ever a single commentator until the middle of the 20th century who ever suggested that this lead in verse to what follows 
was intended by Paul to mean a, an equal reciprocal submission among the groups that are designated. It wasn't until the feminist movement that anybody ever suggested that when Paul said, wives be subject to your own husbands, that the statement was elliptical and could be turned around and that the mutual submissiveness meant, therefore, husbands be submissive to your wives. As I said, nobody ever suggested that until the feminist movement came along and gave this fractured view of the text to the world, which if you follow through significantly in the rest of the text, you would say, as Christ is the head of the church, and of course, the church is the head of Christ. Children, obey your parents means also what? Parents, obey your children. Slaves, obey your masters. Masters, obey your slaves. And that is where we see the reduct. almost said it. Reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> the reduction to absurdity of that approach to the text. The plain meaning of this is that all of us in our different roles have places where we are called to submit. I don't know how many people or groups I'm accountable to. I have the board of directors of Ligonier Ministry. I have the presbytery. I have the board of directors at Knox Seminary, the dean of Knox Seminary, the chancellor at Knox Seminary, the session of St. Andrew's Church where I work. I have all kinds of people to whom I'm accountable, not to mention my wife. <laughs> but briefly, since it's not my task, fortunately, to talk about the role and responsibility of wives and women, I'll just go over this verse quickly, verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord, except to point out one breathtakingly refreshing aspect of this text that doesn't come through in the English version, but is there in the Greek. I didn't make any promises about the Greek. The Greek says in here, when it calls wives to be subject to their or submissive to their own husbands, the Greek is idion on drone, which is translated own husbands or peculiar husbands or particular husbands, or if we want to stretch it just a little bit to be a little bit more literal, it would say, wives, submit yourselves to your idiot husbands. <laughs> and so, wives, the apostle understood something of the difficulty in which he has placed you in marriage. But it goes on to say, for the husband is head of the wife, is also Christ is head of the church. And that concept of headship has also been tortured in our day. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. I'm only going to mention in passing that this certainly gives an awesome responsibility to every wife in the Christian community that they are to be as submissive to their husbands as the church is to be submissive to Christ. And when wives refuse to do that, in this day and age, they simply join a church that is equally disobedient when the church sanctions this kind of rebellion. But in any case, that's an, a dreadful task for any person to have to be in submissive in submission to husbands, but I have always said that the burden placed upon the husband is far worse. And oh, to be a woman, to have the much less responsibility in the marriage relationship than the one given to the men, which reads, husbands, Love your wives, 
just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, love your wives as much as they love you. No, no. Love your wives as much as Christ loves his bride, as much as Christ loves his church. I am supposed to imitate the love of Jesus Christ, which is a self-sacrificing love for my wife, and I am to stand ready to lay down my life for my wife. And I've talked to a lot of Christian women about this, and I said, tell me this, do you think you'd have a hard time being submissive to your husband if you were married to Jesus? I've yet to have a woman, Christian woman say to me, I still wouldn't submit. I'd still want a 50-50 marriage or something like that. No, no, no. But you see, we wouldn't have wives as hostile to husbands if the husbands would do what God commands the husbands to do, which is to love their wives like Christ loves the church. Christ has never exercised a tyranny over his bride. He has never abused his bride. He has never demeaned his bride. He has never betrayed his bride. He has never been unfaithful to his bride. He has never been selfish toward his bride. All he has done is loved his bride with a perfect love. Now he sees his task to present his bride without spot or blemish or wrinkle to the Father. Now, if I am a husband who has been given this commission, I have to be a prophet to my wife. I am called upon to be the principal teacher of the things of God to my wife and to my children. Now, I can retreat from that obligation and turn my children over to the Sunday school or to the Christian school or some other folks and say, you train my children, you bring them up in the way of the Lord, and I'll be the father by paying for it. That's not what God has in mind. But I am to be the prophet of our home. I am called to be a teacher of my little piece of Israel. And for me to teach my children and to teach my wife, I have to first become a student of the Word of God. What I'm saying, gentlemen, is that I believe every husband and every father has a ministry of the Word to his family as he imitates Christ. But not only does he imitate Christ in the prophetic role that he gives, but also as the priestly representative in the house. What does that mean? It means two things at least, that the priest is given to a ministry of intercession. And so the father and the husband is called to pray for his family, to pray for his kids, to pray for his wife. You remember the occasion when Jesus announced to Simon Peter that he was about to betray Jesus, that he would publicly deny him three times. And when Simon hears this, he protests vehemently, never, Lord, I'll never do that. And Jesus looked at him and said, Simon, 
Simon. Satan would have you and sift you like wheat. You're a piece of cake in his hands. But, Simon, I have prayed for you so that when you turn, strengthen the brethren. You see, the disciples were Jesus' adopted brothers, and he prayed for them. He didn't just pray for them when they were about to get into trouble, like he warned Peter on that occasion, but we have the opportunity to eavesdrop on the intercessory prayer of Jesus as we read it in the 17th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. And then we read, as our great high priest, he lives to intercede for us every day in heaven. Our high priest has entered the heavenly sanctuary where he prays for his people. Uh, several months ago at our church, a friend of mine, Archie Parrish, who's in Atlanta and who works with Serve International and also with the denomination there, has put together seminars for churches on teaching people how to pray. Because this is one of the great weaknesses in our church and one of the great burdens of guilt that Christian people today walk around with, a burden that is unresolved. Every Christian knows that he or she ought to be regularly engaged in prayer. And we tell people, you need to pray, you need to pray. But we never do what? We never tell them how. We never show them how. And even the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, show us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Well, that's what Archie Parrish does. He goes around to churches and teaches people how to pray, breaks them up into little groups and so on, where they learn how to pray for 15 minutes a day for three months, and then they go to the next three months where they learn how to pray for 30 minutes a day, and then they do that for three months, and then the third three months they go to 45 minutes a day, and finally in the fourth three months they're at an hour a day. I have 60 people at St. Andrews who have been trained in kingdom-focused prayer, interceding for the ministry of the gospel. Sixty people in our congregation who are involved in that every day. In addition to that, Archie charged our congregation and got the congregation to make a commitment to pray for me and for Vesta three times a day. Every time that they sit down for a meal, not only do they do their table grace, but they also pray for my wife and for me. I think that's incredible. We use Martin Luther's simple way to pray as a guide to teach the people. But the husband and the father, I didn't realize that it was my duty to teach my children how to pray. I prayed for them, still pray for them, but didn't ever think to teach them how to pray. So I wasn't very much of a high priest in my house, in that sense, as far as intercession. But of course, the highest vocation of the priest in Israel was the offering of the sacrifice, which we see was fulfilled perfectly once and for all by Christ. I cannot repeat the atonement of Jesus Christ for my family. But I, can, I cannot give a perfect sacrifice for their sins. All I can do for my family as their priest is to give myself to them. I mean to give me. I said to Vesta today at breakfast, our granddaughter's coming home uh, from college this weekend for, uh, for the conference. And then she's going back to Chattanooga to look out mountain after the end of the conference, and then next week she's coming home again, I guess, for spring break. So she'll be coming home twice in two weeks. 
which creates a little problem for me because my granddaughter and I have adopted a little tradition. Don't tell anybody about this because I don't want everybody to find out about it. But every time she comes home, before she leaves, just before she walks out the door, I not only kiss her, but I shake her hand. And she knows what's coming. Every time I shake her hand goodbye when she's going back to school, I have folded up in the palm of my right hand a $100 bill. <laughs> See, that's not part of her allowance. This is kind of a sneaky, surreptitious thing that Grandpa does for his granddaughter. I give her a slip of her $100 bill. And she always says, thanks, Pappy, you know, gives me a kiss, and off she goes. I said, the best of what am I going to do? She's coming home twice in the next two weeks. <laughs> I said, I can't afford this. It's fun doing that. And every grandfather in the room knows what I'm talking about. It's fun. You know, but it's easy. Do you know what it costs me to do that? $100. <laughs> That's easy. But my family needs a whole lot more than $100. They want me. They want me to give them me. And that's what Paul is saying here is the priestly responsibility of every husband and every father to their wives, and I believe by extension to their children as well, that if we are to give ourselves as Christ gives himself to the church, again, Christ showers us with gifts and the benevolence of his providence, but there is nothing more precious that we receive from Jesus than Jesus. He gives the church, he gives his bride himself. Not just once and for all on the cross in an act of atonement and sacrifice, but from there on throughout eternity, he gives himself to his bride. And finally, we are called to be king to our family. And we like that. Man's house is his castle. In the state of Florida and in most states in America, there is a castle rule in law that defines the right of self-defense in the event of trespassing. If you, for example, carry a concealed weapon in your automobile, and somebody comes up to you at a gas station and threatens you, you don't have the right under the law to pull out that gun and blow that person away. You are required to do everything within reason to avoid a confrontation that could end in violence. But if somebody intrudes into your house, you can shoot them dead, according to the law. Now, the only reason I'm so much aware of this is because I was raising this question a few weeks ago in our house because we had a home invasion three times in two weeks that threatened the security and well-being of my family. Our house was invaded on three occasions by a black bear, came into our garage. A big black bear came into our garage. And that's scary, folks, when a big black bear comes in your house. And I was making inquiries about what my rights were with respect to the protection of my family. And I'm not sure, but I think I'm not allowed to shoot the bear. I can shoot you if you come in my house, but 
but the black bear is protected in the state of Florida. But I think the next time, I'm going to challenge that law and appeal to the castle law that a man's home is his castle and black bears aren't allowed to mess with it. But we like to think that uh, God has given us a license to reign over our household. And so often, we manifest the reign of Ahab more than the reign of David or of Christ. But we are called to be servant kings. We have the responsibility for rule, but the rule is to be according to righteousness. And that is an awesome responsibility that I'd like to duck, frankly, and not have to deal with it. But we have that responsibility. But that responsibility is coupled, as I said, at the same time that we're called to be king, we're called to be servants. Because that's what Christ was. He was the Ebed Yahweh, the servant of the Lord at the same time that he was the king, the long-awaited Messiah king. And to show the connection, I'm going to do something here just a little bit unusual by fast-forwarding through Ephesians 5. And in the Ephesians 6, where we have children obey your parents in the Lord and so on, and the an appeal to the commandment, honor your father and mother. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Again, the responsibility to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord goes to the father, not to the mother. Now here's the portion of Ephesians that I believe is the most neglected portion of this whole section of, of Scripture. And there's an obvious reason for its neglect, and that is because it doesn't seem, at least at first glance, to have any application to our world, to the context of our society, of our nation. For it reads this. Bond servants, douloi, slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Let me just stop there for a second. Everybody likes to read about wives be submissive to your husband because that's such a controversial thing. We have a crisis in the family, and so the children obey your parents is something that we study in Sunday school class. But then when we get to this last segment that gives the responsibility of slaves to obey their masters, that's when we shut the book. We say, because that doesn't have any relevance to us. Oh, yes, it does. Why? Because even though the human societal institution of slavery has been abolished, which abolition had the seeds sown in the New Testament itself. Nevertheless, the chief metaphor that the Apostle Paul uses to describe his office of authority in the church and to describe his role as a representative of Jesus Christ is a metaphor that he applies not only to himself as an apostle, but to every single Christian. Paul's favorite way to introduce himself in his epistles is what? Paul, a doulos, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Rome, and so on. And then Paul extends that relationship to us when he reminds us by saying, you are not your own, but you have been bought with a price, even the price 
of the blood of the Curios, the Lord Jesus Christ. The very word church Church in English, Kirk in Scotland, Kirk in Holland, Kirche in German, all sound the same because they all come from the same root etymologically from the Greek word kuriake, which is a form of the noun kurios, which is the New Testament word for Lord. And a Lord, among other things, is one who owns slaves. And the word kuriake, from which we get the English word church, means, it's the genitive, the possessive form, those who belong to the curios. Those who are owned by the curios. And so every member of the body of Christ is a person who is owned by Jesus, whom Jesus purchased with his blood. So in that sense, we still are slaves, slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ, bond servants to God who alone can make us free, so that when the New Testament gives admonitions to slaves, rather than closing the book at that point, we need to open the book and devour the instructions that the apostle gives here, where he says this. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters with fear and trembling. In sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's slave or free. So that the slave, according to the flesh in the first century, was called by the apostle to give obedience to his master from the heart, sincerely. Not as man-pleasers, or not with eye service. What is eye service? You all know what eye service is. It's when you're working at your desk or you're working at your task and the foreman is there or the supervisor is there, the boss is there, and while the boss is on the floor, you are working furiously, but as soon as you see out of the corner of your eye that the boss or the supervisor or the foreman leaves the floor, then the pace changes. That's the kind of worker who only works when he's being supervised. He only works when somebody's watching him. And Paul is saying, if you're a slave, you shouldn't have to have somebody with a whip standing over you. You should be offering your service from the heart as a gift to Christ himself not just to win the applause of men. Now, when Paul writes to the Galatians, when he's involved in the fierce controversy with the Judaizers there, who are undermining the very gospel itself, you recall how Paul begins that epistle to the Galatians, when he warns them about departing from the gospel, and he expresses his astonishment that they had so soon moved away from purity of of, of faith. And he says, I say unto you that if anybody preaches unto you any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be anathema. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. 
And if you didn't get it the first time, Paul says, again I say to you, if anybody preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, even an angel from heaven, let him be damned. Now, then what does he say? The next verse. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I still try to please men, listen, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You cannot be a slave of Jesus Christ and be a man pleaser. But if you are a slave of Jesus Christ, you cannot be a tyrant either. Because if we as fathers and husbands are put in a position of headship or of rule, we are to rule as unto Christ and as servants of Him so that all of the virtues that attend godly servanthood must also attend the husband and the father in the house. I know Luther jokingly, and really, if you know anything about Luther and his relationship to his beloved Katie von Bora, made this comment, again, if you know Luther, you know he was saying it in jest and with real affection. He said, if God wanted me to be married to a submissive woman, he'd have to hew one out of stone. <laughs> it's, it's Luther saying, I can't find one. <laughs> Certainly not married to one. But at the same time, he was married to a godly woman. He was kidding when he said that because he absolutely adored his beloved Katie Von Bora. No, nobody in Ephesians is given a ticket to tyranny. But in all things, the husband and the father is to imitate Christ. And Luther also, and with this I'll close, once made this statement for all Christians that every Christian is called to be Christ to his neighbor. Now, he didn't mean that in any crass way that any Christian can atone for his neighbor's sin. But what Luther was saying there is that we are called to take so seriously the imitation of Christ that by being with us, our neighbor will sense that they have learned something about the character of Jesus. That's a tall order. But where its fulfillment starts is where the husband and the father becomes Christ to his wife and to his children by way of imitation. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for families. We thank you for wives and for husbands, for children, for grandchildren. We thank you for the unspeakable blessings that these relationships can mean to us as human beings. And we pray that there will be a healing in our nation of this most basic of all human institutions. That people will no longer despise the institution of marriage or the sanctity of the home but rather will see the home as a refuge 
and as a replica of the church itself. For we ask these things in Jesus' name.